tragedy on Detroit's west side. A woman is facing murder and child abuse charges in the death of her friend's three-year-old. A highly contagious but highly preventable disease pops up again in Metro Detroit. We're going to show you where. Good afternoon, Paula. There she is, Allie Hayes, today meeting with members of Congress. I'm Debbie Dinkle. How are you? How are you? She is working to level the playing field for organ transplants with people with disabilities. I'm Fort Warren meteorologist Kim Adams. We have snow on the way. A winter weather advisory just issued for part of Metro Detroit. We'll talk about where and how much coming up. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. And we are going to start things off first at 4 with the weather. Kim Adams has been warning us that snow is coming. She is here now with a timeline and how much to expect. Uh, well... I mean, I know. really, <laughs> 70 degrees last week, and now we have a winter weather advisory in effect for parts of Metro Detroit. This was just issued moments ago. It's from 6 a.m. tomorrow until midnight. It does not include the city of Detroit or any of Wayne County, Monroe County, or Washtenaw County. Only where you see highlighted here in this bluish purple color it goes from 6 a.m. to midnight. It means that weather will be impactful, especially for travel in these communities, and it's pretty long, again, from 6 until midnight. So breaking it down, hour by hour between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. We'll have scattered snow showers, then a break with just a few flurries between 3 and 7 o'clock. So hopefully that gets us through the evening commute before more snow showers return. Some could be heavy between 7 and midnight tomorrow night. Looks like all in all we'll pick up anywhere from 1 to as much as 4 or 5 inches, and I'll show you that coming up in the forecast as to where it breaks down in your neighborhood. 36 degrees in Detroit now, mid-30s in Howell. Feels a little warmer than yesterday, even though temps are about the same because we don't have the high winds. But we are tracking the snow showers back out to the west that will arrive for your morning commute tomorrow, and that snow continues again up until about 3 o'clock, then a brief break before more snow returns between between 6 and 8 p.m. We'll talk about the snow for tomorrow, plus your weekend forecast and what's going to happen with all this snow we're getting coming up. All right. Thank you, Kim. We have some disturbing new information this afternoon coming to light in the death of a small child right here in Detroit. This is Harmony Henderson. She just turned three. Her mother's lifelong friend offered to watch Harmony last weekend. But now that friend, Aisha Harris, is charged with the little girl's murder and is being held without bond. Live at 5, Sean Lay is with Harmony's mom, who shares the shocking details of how her daughter was burned with scalding water and suffered a devastating head injury. We're also learning more about the deadly shooting of a Michigan congressman's brother over in Vienna Township near Clio. 27-year-old Timothy John Kildee was arraigned today on 16 charges in connection to the death of his father, 59-year-old Timothy Edward Kildee. Timothy Edward was U.S. Representative Dan Kildee's brother. The suspect was arraigned this morning from his hospital bed. He was hurt after crashing his dad's car. He's due in court April 5th. Washtenaw County is reporting a new case of measles, and health officials say the infected patient likely caught it from the county's previous patient. Kimberly Gill. It Karen, doctors are so frustrated about this because the measles vaccine most people get in early childhood has been proven safe and is 97% effective. So in this case, more than 72 hours has passed, so it's too late for people to get immediate vaccination to prevent infection if they think they too were exposed. This is Washtenaw County's second case this year and the fourth in the state of Michigan. The infected person is an adult without prior immunity to measles, meaning they were most likely not vaccinated against it and had not previously been infected. They were exposed to the previous Washtenaw County case, which was reported back on March 3rd. The virus can live up to two hours in the air and anyone who lacks that immunity is very likely to get sick. One in five patients require hospitalization. The possible exposure locations for this patient are all within the city of Ann Arbor between March 10th and March 15th. They include the U of M Hospital Emergency Waiting Room, Alice Lloyd Dormitory at U of M, two CVS locations, one on Jackson Road and another on Plymouth Road, Next Care Urgent Care, that's on Washington Avenue, and Trinity Health Primary and Urgent Care on Jackson Road. We've listed the exact dates and times in this story on our website. Just go to clickondetroit.com. Now, the initial symptoms of measles, we want to talk about those. They include a high fever that can spike above 104 degrees, 
cough, runny nose, and red watery eyes. After two to three days, tiny white spots can appear inside the mouth. At least three to five days, a rash appears on the face, which usually spreads to other parts of the body. So anyone who thinks they might have had measles is asked to immediately call their doctor or an emergency room so they can prepare and take measures to avoid exposing others mm -hmm. to this very contagious virus. Karen, we'll send it back to you. All right, we appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. U.S. Justice Department filed a blockbuster lawsuit against Apple today. The antitrust suit claims Apple monopolized the smartphone market, harming some apps, streaming services, and competing products. They claim Apple did so with restrictive app store terms and also high fees. They also claim Apple tightly controls how third-party tech companies interact with its products and services. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. For developers, that has meant being forced to play by rules that insulate Apple from competition. And as outlined in our complaint, we allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power, not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. Apple, meantime, released a statement today saying, in part, this lawsuit threatens who we are and the principles that set Apple products apart in fiercely competitive markets. We believe this lawsuit is wrong uh, of the facts and the law, and we will vigorously defend against it. If you owe student debt, keep a close eye on your email inbox. President Biden has canceled $5.8 billion of debt for certain qualifying borrowers. This latest round of relief applies to nearly 78,000 public sector workers through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Qualifying borrowers include teachers, social workers, some nurses and doctors, and government lawyers who have made 10 years of monthly payments. The White House is sending congratulatory emails to them next week. A special moment last night for a really determined young lady from Metro Detroit. Today I have seen so many people who inspire me to keep advocating for a better life for people who have Down syndrome. I like to fight for whatever I believe in and to aim for the stars. That's Allie Hayes, a Troy woman accepting the prestigious Stephen Beck Jr. Champion of Change Award from the National Down Syndrome Society. She received the award for her advocacy work for vulnerable and disabled people across the country. As if that isn't big enough, today has been monumental as Allie meets with members of Congress to discuss making organ transplants more accessible to the disabled. Paula Tutman has this important follow-up. For Allie Hayes in Washington, D.C., advocating for disabled and vulnerable adults, and on her agenda, a little-known uncomfortable reality in the world of organ transplants and who can or will be a recipient. We should be talking about it. It's definitely something that should be talked about. Last night, step one, something rarely achieved. This bill prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in the organ transplant system. The unanimous bipartisan passing of H.R. 2706, which prohibits health care providers and other entities involved in matching donated organs with recipients from denying or restricting an individual's access to organ transplants solely on the basis of the individual's disability. It has been told, yes, the, the law is on the books. However, it's not what's happening in practice. I think our health system, it's not a surprise to anyone that our health system has disparities. Dr. Meredith Barrett is a transplant surgeon for University of Michigan Health and the Transplant Center. She speaks candidly about what can happen in some programs when a disabled person is the next name on the list. We have, you know, kidney patients on average are waiting three to five years for a transplant. And so I think with that limited resource and being thoughtful about being stewards of the gift of transplantation, it can be easy to try to make our list shorter by potentially, um, you know, taking someone who might have a disability or someone who might not be your standard patient and saying like that is a contraindication to transplantation. But it's not that cut and dry because part of being an eligible recipient is the ability to care for the rare and precious gift of that transplanted organ. Taking complicated anti-rejection medications, getting to doctor's appointments, following directives to make sure the transplanted organ thrives. That said, she agrees that more needs to be done to level the recipient field for the patients with disabilities who are otherwise healthy enough to receive the gift of an organ. 
Accountability is something that we need to continue to work on. From the early trip to the Capitol, navigating tunnels, sign-ins, and just D.C. in general. We're going to get a, a crash course on how to make our way through Congress today. She's moving through the labyrinth of our system of speaking with lawmakers. I'm Debbie Dinko. How are you? How are you? being heard, being understood, and then turning those words into action. Well, if this bill passes, uh, they're going to have doctors and organizations are going to have to answer some questions about why did you bypass that particular person with disabilities? It's just a check and balances of, you know, why did you, it appears that you discriminated, why did you do that? And they're going to have to answer to that. I'm in D.C. and I'm making it happen. <laughs> Yeah, you are. She is making it happen. So she met with two members, two congresspeople from Michigan, as well as both of our senators. Keep in mind, yes, there are laws on the book, on the books. What Ali is trying to do is shore up those laws and create layers so that, again, you have equitable coverage for people with disabilities. And by the way, Karen, I don't know if you know this, but the cherry blossoms are in bloom again, darling, <laughs> in Washington, D.C. So we'll just call this the cherry blossom on top of a really, really cool pie. Ooh, I like that. All right, thanks, Paula.